So to start, hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. We have with us Dr. Angelita P. Howard. She is the Director for Online Education and Expanded Programs and an Assistant Professor at Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Howard holds degrees in music, education, and business. She has taught classes for undergraduate, graduate, and PhD students and has been integral in the development and implementation of strategic plans in collaboration with academic staff for new and ongoing online program expansion. Her current research includes faculty teaching and learning, self-directed studies in the biotechnology industry. She most recently created a summer pipeline program built to expose people to the biotechnology industry. She currently teaches two courses in the DHP program at Logan University, including diversity in education and leadership. So without further ado, Dr. Howard. And the cheers start, yay! So welcome everybody, welcome to Logan University. Before, before I, you know, that, that, that speech was so good. It sounds so good. I, I don't even know who she was talking about, but I guess for time's sake, she was, she was supposedly talking about me. Um, but so I'm so glad I'm excited to be here guys. Um, I, I, I think our, I mean, even though we'll introduce her later, but certainly we have one more, uh, person that absolutely has to at least say hello before I get started. And she is none, none other than our program director. So. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Laura Rauscher. I'm the new program director here for the DHPE program. When the idea came to us to have a webinar presenting the DHPE, I could think of none other than Dr. Howard, as you can see by her effervescent personality, and she's been with the DHPE program since its inception. So I'm working behind the scenes to questions as well, but without further ado, I will turn it back over to Dr. Howard. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so let's get started. So I didn't, I, I let, let me put a disclosure out here. I will not read to you much. So you're gonna have to read some. And who is zoomed out? Raise your hand if you're zoomed out or put a little emoji on the, you know, use your reaction button and put a little emoji and say, I'm zoomed out. If you're, yep, me too. I am zoomed out. So. Let's see, who has their timer on? It's 6.08, but I, I don't know. Let's just go for it. All right, so here's the overview. Let me, let, I have been here, I think this program started uh, around 2017, was that 17? And I have been here really since the inception. So there were some courses that were going ahead of before I got here because I teach the leadership and the diversity course. And, um, but from, from the beginning, it has just been absolutely wonderful. So it's a 60 credit hour program. Yes, you can go full-time and or part-time. What does that look like? Um, uh, it, it is absolutely up to you. For me, I just, I completed an MBA. I did an accelerated program. It was one year. For me, I wanna get done. I like to, to get in, get done and get it through. But certainly you have the option is 100 percent asynchronous so wherever you are that's wherever you will work we will not have you on many zooms or times that you have to always be together so you can be on vacation you can be wherever you are and still get the full benefits of the program um as as um diana mentioned her her colleague talked about the benefits of what she's learning or what she has learned in the program, absolutely true. Uh, there are so many benefits for in this healthcare experience. For example, in my class, I have, or classes that I've had, I have nutritionists, I have people, uh, 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 in, uh, we've had PAs, nutritionists, we've had uh, educators, and we'll we'll see the demographics later, but I've had a variety, even trainers, people, uh, physical trainers, uh, boxing, people who are interested in boxing, PT. So this, this program is absolutely what I would say comprehensive, comprehensive in that you can really be any background and do well, anything related to health and, and, and do a really good job. So here are, the faculty backgrounds. Can someone guess what my background is? Who am I? 
under the faculty educational background, here's some examples. We got some DCs, mathematics, education administration, dietitians, all of, I mean, we counselors. What do y'all think I am? You can unmute and say, no wrong answers. Yes, there will be, but I'll let you know. Um, leadership? Oh my gosh, yes. Ah, yes, absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. So, you know, you have, again, a, a variety of background with your, with different knowledges that will, knowledge points that will help you and that will make sure um, uh, you, you have what it is that you need. What do you not see? What, what area do you not see? I just, I'm just looking at this now and really thinking about it now that I see it. What is something that you don't see that you probably would want to see as it relates to the credentials? No wrong answer. Specifically talking to Drew and Diana, let me give y'all some hints. I don't see anybody who's really directly in medicine, right? Like a PA. Yeah. But that's not a bad thing. I'm just saying. I, I just noticed that because you both are PAs. So I don't. So 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 this might be just their 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 uh, terminal degrees. It might not necessarily mean that we don't have some PAs in there. I don't know. I just thought about that though. <laughs> Okay, so here are our population of students, and that's what I was just talking about. We have athletic trainers, business owners, PT, PA, uh, DC, you name it. We have a variety of students, massage therapists, and we're hoping to grow this number, this physician assistant, so that should say three in about two months, right? When are y'all coming in? I'm planning on May. May, okay. So six months, seven months. When are you coming, Drew? When do the cohort, are there cohorts continuous throughout the year or is there certain uh, start dates? So, so are we still having three start dates? So there's still, okay, three start dates. So when is the next start date? It's gonna be January. So it all depends on how many plates I can balance since I, work a full-time clinical job and I'm three-quarter time faculty. Um, so adding this, uh, I got to start figuring out how to, to uh, juggle the time and wear yes. several hats. How, how to add another thing onto your plate. Absolutely. You know what you do? You do this right here. And then you will win. All right. So, <laughs> so here is, here's the curriculum. Um, he, it, this is an overview of what you will take from issues, the foundational courses, issues in professional health uh, through instructional design, statistics, educational practice. So what, what we're looking at doing, what, what is happening is this is the pedagogical stance of health education. How do we, how do we get into teaching and learning? How do we continue to build that? And especially, you know, when you're, you're, you're thinking about PA, PA education, surgical technology, how do I build my teams? How do I build my educational teams? How do I continue to lead my educational teams uh, and, and, and help them grow? Because honestly, as I just said before we got on, um, I'm teaching a course that's actually, it, it is called uh, teaching for faculty. And so we all understand that in order to teach, you really have to have the hours, the subject matter expert expertise. You don't necessarily have to have the pedagogy behind it, but how even more wonderful when you do have it and then you're able to teach and train and then put something else on your plate because people will come to you and say, hey, you know, we want to do some teaching and learning and we want to build this teaching academy or this teaching learning center. And we know that you have your DHPE. So now we want you to lead that and, and that will happen. So uh, we always know in higher education, the more you do, the better you are, the more that's put on your plate. So um, this, again, this is our curriculum. We go into, you know, year three education practicum, uh, one and two, and then your applied research project. 
I, I want to, you know, pause right here. So, because we're on the curriculum and ask what questions might you have about the curriculum? Is there something you want to know about specific course about how the, uh, how the practicum, please feel free to ask any questions that you have about the curriculum. Well, Diana, I'm not sure if you participated in the PAEA conference last week, but um, yeah. th there was a huge emphasis put on diversity and inclusion in the PA field, and not just with, you know, um, people of color. Um, and one of the things that I didn't get out of that was men in the profession, because it's become a very female driven uh, profession. Um, so I see one class there in diversity and education, but obviously this is going to be a hot topic you know, for the next 10 years. So do you see your curriculum changing at all um, with more diversity and inclusion in higher ed? So I'll, Dr. Walsh, I'll, I'll let you answer that. I'm trying to find my mute button here. Uh, yes, yeah, funny, Drew, as we have been um, having this conversation as of late, Dr. Howard did a, DHPE seminar for us. We hold monthly seminars where the students and faculty can get together. And the first one was on social injustice and racial inclusion topics. So what we've challenged our faculty to do by the, by the beginning of fall 2021 is the implementation of diversity assignments within each course. Um, a few of our courses already have them implemented in there. And then obviously we have the diversity and education course, but we're wanting to integrate that with readings and assignments for our students in each course. One of the things that when you talk about diversity that I absolutely agree and believe, one of the things that keeps people uh, connected is that they feel, first of all, connected, is that they feel that what they're learning uh, or being taught is something that's applicable to what they want to do and how they want to grow and what they want to see. So there has to be an alignment. And I and I and 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 Logan does a great job aligning those 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 areas, those avenues with students so that they're feeling that they're not having to uh, necessarily back away from what they enjoy or from what their passions are. And so, at, you know, in the previous slide where I showed the students, the different type of students, that is a representative of what who the students are. And in the classroom, uh, because again, I teach two of the courses, they're fully, they're, their papers, their assignments are based on what they are doing, the work that they're doing, the work that they are enjoying. So it is not trying to have them pivot, which is one reason why I enjoy it so much because it's like, I'm learning, even for me, I, yes, I'm a teacher, but I'm certainly just as much as the student because I'm learning about different areas or aspects where in some programs, um, you are really focused on you know that that subject matter or whatever that is instead of really pulling out what you're doing and focusing on what your passions are and so i think that that helps us as we build or talk about diversity and how do we uh build a diversified audience or school a uh, participant students and how do we how do we retain them we actually have an arp and uh, in the queue right now, it's in the beginning stages from an individual in the admissions office, in an unadmissions un office, excuse me, who is looking at retention of diverse students and what that looks like for individuals who've already graduated and how students can find models or individuals in the field for the, f the respective fields that they're trying to go into. So it's, it's, <laughs> an ARP we truly have. I just read it last week in the queue already that we're, we're looking to approve. And so while you're there, if you want to go ahead and talk about the AARP and how that looks, uh, Dr. Rosher. Sure. I, I have to say, uh, when I completed my doctorate, we finished our coursework and then they charged us for 12 credit hours of dissertation and just kind of threw us to the wolves and said, let me know when you've got something. And 
five years later, I had something. So yeah, what our program does that I think is just absolutely phenomenal, we have an introduction to proposal course. And in that course, you're working on a very rough draft of um, writing your proposal. So it's no more than eight pages initially. It's including your research questions, the study aims, and getting the background literature review in place so that way when you go to the ARPA course, the first one, um, that's when you're moving that proposal into the final stages to get IRB approval and to start collecting data. So over that 15 weeks, you've got, uh, we have a full-time faculty member, Dr. Carter, who works with you individually and works on making sure your project is moving along in those 15 weeks. When you go into ARPB, they do, she does the same thing. You've got that 15 week time frame to finish collecting your data, write up the results, and then present it to the professional audience. So I think it's a magnificent timeline because they keep you within that time frame of the three different 15 week courses to ensure you're on the right track and that you're getting that out and you're getting out the door rather than doing it the Laura way, which was long and long so do you have specific questions about the ARP uh, no okay <laughs> I just have a, a question that sort of relates to this do students have to seek a mentor outside at their own university or elsewhere or is there plenty of mentorship provided or, or preceptorship however you want to both. You're absolutely able to seek a mentor if you have a home university. A lot of times that uh, faculty member can work in conjunction with our faculty here to ensure that the subject matter is where it needs to be. Um, Dr. Carter's background is research and statistics, so she loves running data and loves reading data. Thank goodness somebody does. And so she's really helping that part and making sure that you're picking the correct methodology, the correct statistical um, analysis, and then that it's written up accurately. So you're able to approach a subject matter expert if needed, or we've got faculty on in our staff that can do that. So how about the um, tuition exchange program through TEP and the Council of Independent Colleges, um, your, your program participates in that at the doctorate level, is that correct? Yeah, I can, I can go ahead and take that. Um, yes, we actually um, do have quite a few students participating in tuition exchange um, for um, really multiple programs at Logan. So primarily DHPE, we do see a handful there uh, and also for our master's programs. But yes, as long as your institution is, is part of that program, we're usually very willing to work with students on that because um, we, we export about the same number that we bring in. So usually we can bring in pretty much as many students as apply for that in, in a typical year. Um, obviously can't guarantee that, but the vast majority that, that I've worked with, at least in the past, have been approved for tuition exchange through Logan. So um, definitely something that we're always willing to work with students on if that's if that's an option for you. And are there deadlines uh, for, uh, to apply? Like, for example, to start the January cohort, are we past that deadline for the tuition exchange? On our end, you're not past that deadline. That's something you would probably need to speak with your exporting institution about um, just to, and, and yeah, if you just check with your liaison there, they should be able to give you a little bit more information on, on that end of things. Um, but with us, yeah, we should absolutely still be able to approve that for the January trimester if that's something you're interested in doing. So uh, as long as they're willing to approve it, we, we should still be able to work with you for the January term on that. And do you have a preference for CIC versus TEP? Um, not typically, no. We've accepted students for, for both. Um, so whichever whichever your institution is, is a participating member and we you know, we'll definitely work with you on that. Um, it's something that it'll go through our HR department and then they usually contact us to let us know which way you're coming in and we'll um, kind of work all the back end paperwork and stuff from there, so. And you can do that on a part-time versus a full-time basis? Correct, yeah. Um, so you're, it, it, I believe the award is valid for four years, um, but even if you do pass that mark, I think most people are able to apply for an extension on that. Um, something again that I would probably recommend checking with your, your export institution just to make sure um, that, that that would be a possibility. Um, but I, I believe we have had students who have done that in the past, but the initial award is for up to four years typically. 
in the million dollar question, uh, what's what sets your program apart from doing an EDD or the DMSC programs or even a PhD program? Dr. Rauscher, do you want to take that one? Once again, if I can find my unmute button, <laughs> I'm at a clinic and so every once in a while you'll hear the Dr. Somebody Room 109, so I, keep, I try to stay muted if you're not <laughs> interfering. Um, what sets you apart is that it's going to be a unique uh, designation. So DHPE obviously very common in Europe and it's starting to make its way over here to the United States. PhD and EDD is well known right now but even with those designations you really need to look at the specific um, program and the the designation of what that degree is to really know what that person's trained in where a DHP says it in the actual designation of doctorate in health professions education. So when you're looking at university administration, faculty jobs, they're going to recognize DHPE instead of having to do that exploratory work of PhD or EDD and what that means to that specific individual. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to make sure that you understand you are in phenomenal hands if you decide to come to Logan. We certainly want you to come to Logan. It is our hope and desire that you will choose Logan, but I, I, I want to make sure that you know that our director, who is maybe six months in, are you six mm -hmm. months a year? Yeah. About six months. <laughs> yeah, six months in has uh, had a plethora of experiences and um, has come in and just, you know, started reshaping, uh, realigning some things. I mean, just has come in and really taken a hold of what was happening and expanded day by day. So she's always looking for ways to enhance, improve, modify. Um, I think sometimes she doesn't think I have a full-time job because she will send me emails and say, let's think about this. Let's think about this. Do you want to, we're going to change this. We're going to work on this. And I'm like, okay, well, let's get to work. So she's always, <clears throat> which I appreciate because I have been at institutions where I go a year and don't hear from the director. And that's in all seriousness. So it's really, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful to know. I mean, I teach two classes, but so I'm normally teaching every semester, but not every, both classes each semester. But she's always engaging with the faculty, always making sure um, that our students are well equipped, that students have the information, the knowledge. Uh, we, we do these, we've started these monthly seminars and the seminars just about different events, what's happening, what's taking place, which continue to engage our students. Uh, to me, that's important in any program, again, because I've been in several, I've had my fair share. Um, I don't think in my MBA program that I just finished last year, I did an MBA uh, in pro project management. I could not tell you who my director was. I, I d it was online. I do not know. Now I heard from the uh, advisor, my support person. I heard from my support person often at least maybe once or twice every uh, term. But for, as it relates to, and then that kind of dwindled off, but I cannot tell you, and I went there for, a, for an entire year. Um, I, I could not tell you who the director was. So <clears throat> that engagement is, is extremely important. We are a very tight-knit family. And so we, we share, we have emails. Um, we are supporting the students. That is our number one goal. That is our number one concern. Um, we are very, you know, a student doesn't email and not receive a response. Usually, if not the same day, certainly within the next day, that's yeah, weekends included. And so um, I appreciate that. I, again, I, I can tell other places I've been where those were not the same expectations. And because we're all working adults, I, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us how we interact with, uh, with our students and making sure that they have what they need, even though sometimes we understand all of us being, most of us being in education, that we sometimes wait to the last minute and it's like, oh, I forgot this. 
But um, the way that our faculty, our team is, is, is made up, we are number one supporters of students. So I do hope that you all will consider, highly consider joining Logan. Um, it's, it's a really great decision, which, which I'm certain you know or will know. But I, I want to open up for questions. We have the team. And so what other questions might you have for us? Go ahead, Diana. I've been asking all the questions. No, you asking questions is helpful to me. Um, you ask good questions. Um, so you said that the program just started in 2017. Is that right? As in your first students matriculated or graduated at that time? Our first students graduated around 2017. The program started in 2014. And okay. so they were part-time and um, did, did the program through those three years and then graduated in 2017. Okay. Uh, what are your statistics like in terms of where you've been able to place, uh, where students have, uh, whether they've been able to get new jobs, have, have different opportunities or promotions? Do you know anything like that about your graduates at this point? And I may have to defer to admissions on that one. Most of our students coming in already have the position that they want, their faculty um, or their administration already, and somebody's urging them to get the doctorate in order to maintain that position. And so I don't know the exact statistics on the alum, but most of our students are already, and I, I wish I had that slide pulled up, but they're in faculty positions or they're in practice and they're needing that designation in order to, to continue on. Yeah, I think there are a decent amount of people who are, um, you know, needing some sort of terminal degree, a doctorate level you know, degree um, to continue getting to where they want to professionally. Um, as far as specific, you know, what people are doing after they graduate, that's something that I can absolutely reach out to our career services department. Um, they do, you know, surveys and reach out to graduates after they're finished with the program and everything like that to see if we can get a little bit more um, specific information on that. And either myself or one of our admissions coordinators who's working with you um, should be able to get you a little bit more information on that, you know, sometime over the next week or two once we can get a chance to touch base with them and, and hopefully gather them more, more specific information for you. But yeah, like Dr. Rauscher said, a lot of people are, are looking to do this um, to just kind of enhance what they're already doing and branch out into something maybe a little bit new in that area that they're already a part of, um, or just getting a, a degree that is going to be terminal at the doctorate level for them in the future. How many current students are in the cohorts? We, within each cohort? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to um, to identify because we don't specifically have cohorts because some people go full time, some people go part time. But new students starting each trimester is usually usually excuse me around five to seven students. Okay. And Zachary, you could probably this would probably be a question for you. What's your acceptance rate and uh, matriculation rate? Sure. So yeah, we, we actually don't have um, uh, selective admission at this point. So anybody that meets the admissions criteria is able to start the program. So for that reason, we don't really have an acceptance rate. Um, as long as you meet the admissions criteria and are going entirely through the process, um, we're, we're usually willing to work with students on that um, to get you enrolled in the program. Um, and at this point, the matriculation rate for that degree, um, the number of students that apply for the program versus the number of students that start, I think is around 70%, at least it has been for the last couple of trimesters. Um, now that the program is a little bit more, you know, has, has gotten up to speed from those first couple of terms. Um, obviously when a program gets off and running, that can be a little bit shaky. So um, now that we have Dr. Rauscher in place and, and some great faculty, faculty like Dr. Howard to um, refer students to, to speak with and things like that, um, that, that really does help a lot of students realize early you know, in the admissions process, if this is going to be a good fit or not. So um, we do try to keep that number as high as possible, obviously. And if it's not a good fit, we we don't want students to start this because like you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, retention is just, I mean, that's usually the more important thing is making sure that you have students who are actually going to benefit from the degree. Um, you know, we don't want students to get halfway through the program and realize that it's not going to be a good fit and they're not actually going to utilize the degree after they graduate. So that's why we do have, you know, students a lot of times participate in these webinars or um, have conversations with Dr. Rauscher and, and things like that 
ahead of time so that you can make that decision early on and um, and hopefully you know realize that, that this is going to be a good fit for you if, if you know if you decide that's the route you want to go and we probably need to mention Stacia, who was unable to yeah, join this but <laughs> Stacia Rosen is the academic success coach for the DHPE program. And so she works with each student each trimester to find out what classes to take each trimester, what the rest of your academic degree plan looks like, and then any issues that may come up. Um, needing a pause in your program. I mean, I can't fathom how busy Stacia has been this year with COVID related issues and what that's looking like for people's programs. Stacia is your first point of contact with that. And she's just magnificent. She knows everybody's individual story. She knows their program, their plans, their future career goals. And so she's one more part of our team that just keeps this program flowing effortlessly. Dr. Rosher, what's been your faculty turnover? I mean, I know you, you're new on the job, but historically in the program, has that been a challenge uh, with the DHP program? Not that I'm aware of since I've been here. Um, and I just received an email. I sent out confirmations to everybody wanting to teach next semester, making sure they were able and willing. And somebody just responded back. Do Dr. Sobater said, I'm so beyond thrilled to get to teach for Logan again. So the faculty that we have, we have 13 adjuncts and that varies per trimester about which, which courses are open and which ones are closed as far as we try to keep enrollment steady in specific courses. Um, the, the faculty love the courses and they are, each course is their own baby. So they get to make it the way they want to and, and then they have ownership over it, which you want your faculty to have because then they've got the autonomy in the courses and they've got the buy-in in working with the students for those. So since I've been here, knock on wood, I have not had any faculty turnover um, that I'm aware of that, and yeah. I don't know any in the history. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, for the most part, I don't, I mean, we've added faculty because we, we needed to, um, but since I've been here the last three years, we've had, we've maintained the faculty, which again speaks to the program. Hello, Emily. I see Emily came in. Hello, Emily. How are you? Welcome. But Emily, I think, is having a little trouble with her microphone and video, so she might not be able to introduce herself. But she's she's actually one of our admissions coordinators as well. She could oh, okay. got to jump in a little bit late. So, okay, um, okay. I just yeah. didn't know that was someone because it didn't say yeah. <laughs> So, are there any classes in the curriculum? My clinical job, I have about nine weeks of vacation a year. So, are are there any courses in the curriculum that you can knock out? Um, in a very short period of time where I can combine some weeks of vacation and rather than taking it over a whole trimester, uh, kind of doing a, a very um, short version of it in a sh shorter period of time. Not yet. That's kind of like an accelerated track and that's, that's a good idea. But as of right now, all of our courses are over the 15 week trimester. The only one that you would be able to move at your own, only ones, excuse me, move at your own pace would be the ARP courses. So you can do your research project as quickly as you'd like to within that. Okay. And then average amount of hours per week expectation to spend on getting the degree? For the doctorate, they suggest five to seven hours per week per course, including reading, discussion boards, and then any assignments that you would have. It's usually a part-time two classes at a time or three? Part-time is two. You can do one if you would like. Uh, I don't know if that's a correct financial aid question. Uh, for, for financial aid purposes, you'll need to be at least half time if you're planning on taking out financial aid through the university. But if you are utilizing a tuition exchange, um, I don't I don't believe there are any restrictions on that. So if you're wanting to take just one course, I think that should be okay. Um, that's something that, that we can definitely check on for you with our liaison just to make sure that that is, is acceptable. But I believe as long as you're not utilizing financial aid, you're still able to just take one course if you ever need to do that for a trimester. But most of our students take two classes for part-time and then three for full-time. So what would be the my undergraduate was in business, so I took statistics a long, long time ago. 
um, like 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And my obviously in PA school, when I went, we didn't do a lot of statistical analysis. Um, is there a foundation course to kind of get you back up to speed to looking at qualitative and quantitative research and statistical methods? We've begged and pleaded Dr. Carter. Once again, her background is in research and statistics, so she thinks this is fun and easy. I would rather go to the dentist. And so we've begged that when she does statistics, the quantitative and qualitative class, that she makes it foundational with absolute awareness that you take those courses to get the content and then you start to apply it once you go into your introduction to proposal course with uh, the very beginning of that with Dr. Olson. Then of course, when you start the ARP. Once again, Dr. Carter, hold your hand through the ARP courses and we'll work with you to identify what statistics and methodology to use and then she helps run that if that's not your forte run the statistics excuse me in terms of timing you mentioned the average part time is taking two classes a semester versus three if you're full time um, what would the timeline be for graduation terms of completing the program if you're doing two at a time? Um, I have that. Does somebody have that answer handy? I believe that's 11 trimesters then, just over three years. I believe I believe that's correct. Yeah, that's, that's actually on our website as well. So I can look that up real quick. If anybody does have any additional questions, I could try to find that and, and clarify um, really quickly. But yes, I believe it is. I, I think it is going to be um, 11 trimesters. So just over three years, essentially, if you're going that route. Yeah, I thought I had seen three years somewhere, but then when you said two classes at a time, I thought, how could I possibly, you know, I'd be finished in three years with two classes at a time, but I'll, I'll take it. So I have a, a ultrasound tech that um, interesting story. Um, she, she had a hard time getting pregnant and had quite a few miscarriages. So she went to go see a chiropractor and he kind of diagnosed her uh, with pelvic congestion syndrome. And uh, he did pelvic manipulation to increase her blood flow to her pelvis. And her husband worked for the, uh, um, the DNR and he was a ranger. Um, and so she finally got pregnant. And um, afterwards he decided to go to chiropractic school. And she now has seven kids mm-hmm. and in, in a year, about nine year over nine years. And unfortunately, he went to Life University. Um, so I contacted him about Life versus Logan. And um, he said that there really isn't a comparison because Logan actually has a better reputation than Life in Atlanta. And... Um, Dr. Howard, you could probably address that since you're, you know, in the Atlanta market and it's in our backyard versus Logan in the Midwest. Yeah, I, you know, life has gone through its fair share of challenges. I don't recall Logan going through those same type of challenges. And I was looking online, I was trying to pull up and maybe Zach is doing it. I was trying to pull up the um, courses, but I think it is three years. Um, I, yeah, I, I was able to just find that really quick. So a full time is seven trimesters, so two years and four months essentially, um, and part time would be ten trimesters, so three years on the dot for that. So I'm fresh out of questions. <laughs> I think I just have one more. Um, we talked a little bit about diversity, which obviously I think we all know is important moving forward. And, um, you know, probably we're all behind on that. But how else do you see the program growing or changing in the coming years? We are working hand in hand with admissions and marketing. <laughs> we, I have a marketing phone call at 9.30 a.m. as a matter of fact, to um, increase once again the viability of 
our program as well as what a DHPE designation looks like. So we're wanting to expand. The beautiful part about an asynchronous program is that you can do it worldwide. And we have one international student right now. And so we're looking at different methods of marketing to the different programs the different professions within their publications at their conferences to try and recruit students that are going to have that passion for health professions and really fit into what the Logan model is. Zach is Shantae. Okay, I see it. I never mind. I got it. Okay. I thought Shantae had something. I saw the movement. Okay. No, I thought she had a question. I couldn't see. Any other thoughts, questions? Thank you, Shante. Okay. So, well, um, what are, Zach, can you tell us the next steps? Anything that uh, the potential students should look to hear from? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just so everybody is aware, um, we have three start dates every year. So January, May, and September. January is our next start date. Um, we are still accepting applications for that term if you're interested in starting that soon. And if not, obviously, we can work with you for one of those later dates as well. Um, if anybody is looking to move forward, um, please feel free whenever you are um, on our website filling out that application, um, feel free to use the referral code ARR and that will waive the $50 application fee for you, kind of help expedite that process a little bit. Um, and your admissions coordinator can also give you that code as well in case you forget that. So um, feel free to reach out to your admissions coordinator with, with direct questions on those next steps. Um, as a reminder, really briefly, um, the admissions criteria for the DHPE program, all we need to kind of get that process started is just your application, which can be filled out on our website. It takes 15 or 20 minutes to get through that. Um, and then, we will require your official transcripts to review. Um, and then there's a resume CV that we will need from you as well. So you need to have at least a 3.0 in a graduate program to qualify. Um, you have to have a graduate or professional degree completed. Um, and from there, we can get you through the admissions process. So if anybody has any additional um, admissions questions or financial aid or anything like that, please feel free to either contact me or um, one of the admissions folks that you're working with and we'll be more than happy to answer those questions for you. Um, and I will follow up with an email um, probably later on this week, just kind of recapping everything that I just discussed with you in case you have any additional questions or anything, we can get those answered for you then. And so for our parting words um, or my parting question, what baseball feel is that behind Zach? Can anyone as anybody tell us? Um, Zach, can you talk so it comes up on the big screen? Of course I can. It should be pretty easy with the oh, uh, background that, picture. That's St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> Forgot that's my polo it. one too. See, you're, you, you are the perfect student. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Arasha, I'll let you close. You are the program director. I'll let you close. Thank you all so much for this time. Thank you, but I'll let her give final words. Yes, thank you so much for the questions and the opportunity for us to explain our wonderful program for you. Thank you, Dr. Howard, for just being Dr. Howard and you know what that entails because it's magnificent. And of course, our amazing admission staff. So it is such a pleasure getting to know you. You guys have my contact information as well, or Zach can include that. Nice thing about Logan emails, they're always our first name dot last name at logan.edu. So um, as Zach mentioned, feel free to reach out to him with admissions and financial aid questions. Feel free to reach out to me with not admissions and financial aid questions because I will defer you right back to Zach anyway. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions questions you may have about the program, coursework, anything along those lines. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Have a good, good weekend.